Okay, now let's talk about wind. Let's start by answering three questions in your notes about this phenomena we call wind. Question one, what exactly is wind? Write in your notes that wind is simply the movement of the atmosphere due to differences in temperature, pressure, and the spin of the earth on its axis. Make sure you get those three causes. Question two, how is wind actually formed? Also get in your notes that wind is formed from the following steps that form a cycle. Step one, the sun heats the land or water like you see here in this slide. Step two, the land or water then heats the air. You see it right here with this hot air rising now. So sun shines on the land, land then heats the air and then step three that heated air starts to rise like you see here and then in the last step step four that heated air is replaced by cooler air and then this scenario starts over again this is the main engine that drives air movement so it's a convection so you got the uh, hot air rising cool air falling etc etc there's that convection, much like the heat of convection um, that drives the rock cycle and moves the tectonic plates. Okay, next let's look at the movement of the air globally, meaning the movement of the entire atmosphere that surrounds the planet. First of all, draw this picture of the globe in your notes right now and then label it, label it correctly just as you see it here. And make sure to include the line around the equator and the directions of the arrows. So get that in your notes right now. Now, write in your notes that global, global movement of air occurs in two ways. Cyclonic, here you see the word cyclonic, and anticyclonic, which you see right here. First, let's talk about cyclonic flow. Get in your notes that in the northern hemisphere, cyclonic flow is counterclockwise around a low pressure, while in the southern hemisphere, it's clockwise around low pressure. So we're talking about cyclonic flow now. Cyclonic flow counterclockwise around a low in the northern hemisphere, clockwise around a low in the southern hemisphere. Also write that in the northern hemisphere, anticyclonic, here's anticyclonic, is just the opposite. Clockwise around a low in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise around a low in the southern hemisphere. Now this may seem confusing right now, but we'll clear it up later when we talk about weather systems. Now onto land and sea breezes. Now these concepts we call land and sea breezes also apply to larger bodies of water, so we can call them land and lake breezes as well. Write in your notes that the land and sea breezes happen because of the difference in the ability of land and sea to hold heat. And that air always moves from areas of coolest air to areas of warmest air. Now, let's talk about sea breeze here first. Here you see a sea breeze. Write that a sea breeze describes a wind that blows from the ocean or lake inland towards land and that this breeze occurs most often in the spring and summer months because of the greater temperature difference between the ocean or lake in the nearby land. Now in particular, it's during the afternoon when this land is at its maximum heating. So air moves from the water, the cooler air right here, this way to the warmer air. Remember, air always moves from coolest to warmest. Question, why does this air move from water to land? If you said because it always moves from coolest to warmest, you'd be right. 
Now at night, the roles reverse. Write that in a land breeze, and here's our land breeze right here. Notice we have sun in the sea breeze and moon in the land breeze. So now, write that in a land breeze, the air over the ocean is now warmer than the air over the land because at night water is warmer because it holds heat longer. The land loses heat quickly after the sun goes down and the air above it cools too. Now, this can be compared to a blacktop road. During the day, the blacktop road heats up and becomes very hot to walk on. At night, however, the blacktop has given up that added heat and is cool to the touch. The ocean or lake, however, is able to hold on to this heat after the sun sets and not lose it as easily. This causes the low surface pressure to shift over the ocean during the night and the high pressure to move over to the land. This causes a small temperature difference between the ocean or lake surface and the land at night and the wind will blow from land to the ocean like you see here. So remember, land is cooler than the ocean at night because the ocean holds on to the heat longer. So that air will move now from land to the water. Okay, now write in your notes that an air mass is a large volume of air with two main distinct properties, temperature and water content. And there are five main types of air masses located on Earth we want you to get in your notes. And you see them listed here on the left, and then you see them located here on a map on the right. Now you need to know the names and the locations for each type of air mass. So let's go through them. First, there are two polar air masses. Two polar, those are the ones in blue, right here. Two polar air masses. Polar maritime, which you see right here. Polar maritime is cool and moist, and it's moist because it's over the Pacific Ocean. And then there's polar continental. And then polar continental now is cold and dry. It's dry now because it's over land. Okay? And these are located above 60 degrees north latitude on the map. So 60 degrees is about right here. Remember, we're at about 46, 60s up here somewhere. Now, next are two tropical air masses, and you see them listed here. Tropical maritime, so here's your tropical maritime, located over both oceans. You see the Pacific here on the left and the Atlantic here on the right and tropical continental. You see those right here, which are located over land. Now these are located within about 25 degrees of the equator. So the equator is down here somewhere. So between the equator and 25 degrees would be the tropical maritime and tropical continental. Now the last is the Arctic air mass. You see that right up here. And those are located nearest the poles. So from, from zero degrees latitude outward would be the Arctic. And then down here you'd have the same thing, uh, but not nearly as cold down here in the South Pole. Make sure you have all those in your notes. Just a brief word about jet streams. Write in your notes that jet streams are rivers of high wind above the atmosphere and that these slim strips of strong winds have a huge influence on climate because they push air masses around and affect weather patterns. So they're located above the atmosphere and they push these large air masses around the globe. And you see four of them here. Polar jet, subtropical jet, here'd be another subtropical jet, and here'd be another polar jet. 
So there's four main jet streams. Now also write that there are two polar and two subtropical jets is really what I want you to get and where they're located. All right, now that we know the major types of air masses and the major force that moves them, let's move on to the kinds of fronts these masses can cause. Write in your notes that a front is a boundary between two different air masses and that there are two main types of fronts, warm and cold. Now, also write that where these boundaries meet is typically where storms occur. Now you see diagram of a warm front here and a cold front here and you're going to see now that these lines, this line right here and this curved line are the front lines. This is a warm front and this is a cold front. Now, write that a warm front is where a warm moist air mass moves into a cold dry one and almost always produces precipitation like you see here in this picture. So here's this warm air mass. Remember warm air is not very dense compared to cold. So when this warm air hits this cold air, boom, it's going to go right straight up. That's why you see this arrow going this way. Sorry about that. So where this warm air meets the cold air, there's going to be some kind of precipitation. And the reason it moves up is this cold air is way denser. Now, a cold front is where cold air, here you see the cold air, moves into warm. So obviously this cold air is going to be able to push this warm front out of the way. And where those meet now is called a cold front. And then you see here uh, precipitation. These would, cold front moving into a warm, is going to produce the most violent weather, whereas warm moving into cold takes a lot longer, obviously, because warm air is, is not as dense. So the weather now in this situation, much less severe, but may last longer. So this, for example, a cold front might produce a violent thunderstorm, but typically thunderstorms don't last very long. Whereas a warm front that moves in where cooler air was produces rain at first, and then you may have cloudy days and drizzle for a couple of days. Okay, when two different air masses meet, clouds form. So before we can understand storms, we need to understand how clouds form and what role they play in these storms. By the way, the clouds formed in Scotland are referred to as mick clouds, which is where my clan got its name. <laughs> Wrong. I just made that up. Okay, clouds can take on all sorts of shapes and sizes ranging from thin wispy cirrus clouds to large dark menacing cumulonimbus clouds. And while there are several factors that influence and affect the formation of clouds, the sun plays a major role in producing clouds. Let's explain how using a familiar term we use when we studied the rock cycle and that we just introduced a few slides ago. Convection. Now to help understand basic cloud formation from convection, let's take a look at a field at sunrise at the beginning of the next podcast. So this is the end of part three. So take a picture of those notes from part two, submit them to Moodle, then go grab that study guide, answer the questions, and submit it when you're done. Okay, I'll see you then in part four of this podcast series on climates and weather in the atmosphere. Bye.